Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Elder Kalinikos, the Hesychast of Malathos, who proposed in the earlier part of the last century, <coughs> had a profound effect on all those around him. He kept himself, as his name suggests, Hesychast, secluded for decades upon decades in a little area which he had his disciples wall in that he never left. A very small, tiny little area, not bigger than a couple of those rugs probably. And that was his asceticism, well, amongst other things. He influenced people like Elder Joseph, the Hezekiah, and many other people that would come to him for advice. He was a man of great prayer who shone with the uncreated light to many people that came to see him. Very much a very solitary seraphim of Saroff. But Elder Kalinikos, on his deathbed, as he's about to depart this world, the last words out of his mouth were, I thank thee, my God, that even if I have done nothing good in my life, I die orthodox. Now, he had done plenty of good things in this life, as we, we know, miracles upon miracles. But yet his greatest thanks was he died within the faith. We have to ponder that word. It's like these people who use words that we use in a different way, like faith, for example. What does orthodox mean? Does it mean I was baptized in the faith? Does it mean I come to church occasionally? Does it mean my parents were orthodox and therefore so am I? Or does it mean that I walk the life of Christ? Does it mean that I live the gospel? Does it mean that as the psalmist says, I think David in the fourth psalm, sacrifice is sacrifice of righteousness and hope in the Lord. The sacrifice of righteousness is our life. We give everything of our life, every moment of our life, everything we have to Christ. In an orthodox manner. Because the faith matters too. And the Lord tells the Besides being aware of the doctrine of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, he still says doctrine. Paul many times warns people to keep those traditions which they have been given and not to depart to false doctrines. Doctrine does matter. And in the Gospel today, we see that clearly. When the Lord says for the Father to glorify thy Son, and thy Son may glorify thee, He's saying this in the midst of his disciples as he's about to be crucified. He's being persecuted right before the crucifixion, right before the passion, giving them strength. But he will be glorified, of course, by a horrible death, but in a resurrection, and in doing so, in his obedience to his Father, the Father is glorified. He prays that there may be one, seeing this happen, one in that faith, the one in this belief in who Christ is, fully God, fully man, fully one with the Holy Trinity, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. These things are absolutely necessary to our salvation. They're not minor things. The Fathers wrote, as I've said before, because they had a soteriological motive to protect the faithful, to protect those, to give the right medications to the church that people could be healed. Because without those medications, salvation is rather precarious. And so the Lord says, Father, Glorify me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is a powerful statement in front of many of the people that I existed beforehand. As he is saying over and over in the Gospel of John, that I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. He who seen me has seen the Father. On and on and on. He proclaims this oneness that he is God. The fathers use this term perichoresis, this working together simultaneously. Everything that the Father does, he does in concert with the Son. Everything the Son does, he does in concert with the Holy Spirit. And all of them together, at all times, not against each other, not opposing each other, of one will. Because natures have a will. And that one nature has one will. And they follow each other and do things together. So this crucifixion is glorifying the Father. But this crucifixion only can be done by someone or be undergone by someone who is God, because without that we are not saved. Trust ye not in princes and the sons of men in whom there is no salvation. Our only salvation is in Christ. Without him being fully man as well, we are doomed. Because a man 
had to go through these things. It was the man who had to suffer for sins. It was a man who had to be taken up to the right hand of the Father as we had on the ascension that our flesh, our nature, humanity might go up to the right hand of God. These teachings are vital. So when this man, Arius, who we see on the icon down here, wearing the brown without the halo around his head, the only which one not to kiss is that one, who looks in awe as St. Spiridon is doing this miracle in front of him with the brick and the oil and the fire coming out of it once, explaining how three things can be in one. Arius looks in awe if you see the icon. Yet Arius did not learn even from that. Arius was a brilliant man, a presbyter of the Church of Alexandria, extremely well-educated, quite the politician who would have fit in well today. He was good at working the people with falsehood, one-liners and phrases. His infamous line, that once was a time when the Son was not, making Christ quite a bit less than the Father, quite a bit less than God, endangers our salvation. But there comes a time in the middle of all this where Arius, of course, had divided the empire greatly over this. This went on for over a hundred years, this one division. And of course, unfortunately, in our own day and age, many people that profess them Christians or themselves Christians are actually Arians and do not believe in the full humanity and divinity of Christ. I remember vividly one time I had just become Orthodox. I was working in this Christian bookstore, and this lady who was the manager there, who was a who was a educated Methodist seminarian and should know her faith, a nice, very nice person, and I were talking about the faith one day, and she, I made this comment about Jesus being God. She looked shocked. I've never heard that. And this was a person that was going to educate Christian children. Of course, we had a discussion about that. I got her thinking. I hope she went home and dealt more with it. But I know the Methodist Church doesn't teach that. Don't get me wrong. I know that's not their particular heresy. It's not their own versions. But for some reason, that is not being emphasized outside of orthodoxy. The theology matters. Who Christ is matters. Who do you say that I am is the question. And Peter answering that the Christ, the Son of the living God, matters. He was praised for that confession of faith, not for who he was, for his confession of faith. But Arius <coughs> thought of a rather shrewd but evil plan that he would uh, reconcile himself to, himself to the church. Sounds like a good thing, but it was completely false. At that time, the hieromotor Peter of Alexandria, the Patriarch of Alexandria, had been arrested and one of the persecutions of the time, Diocletian, Maximian, and then Maximin. And under Maximin, he was thrown into jail because the emperor was not happy that Peter was bringing people away from paganism to Christ. So he was arrested, but the people outside stood outside the doors of the jail and not let anyone come get him. They did not want him killed. But Arius, seeing the weakness of this position, said, I will go repent before Peter in name only. And he convinced everyone that he was doing this genuinely. Leaders wanted him to accept this repentance. Peter had to accept it because, of course, he was estranged from the Church of Alexandria. His bishop was Peter. As Peter is there one night, he calls the other bishops, well, soon to be bishops, his predecessors to him, he prophesied that they would be his, his excuse me, successors. And he says, why, why, your holiness, do you not want us to accept Arius back into the faith. He's trying to repent. This would be good for the empire. He says, no, he doesn't. Last night I saw a vision. The Lord came to me as a young man, a young child, probably 12-ish. And he had a garment. But it was ripped in front, ripped asunder. And he was holding it together. And he looked sad. And I said, my Lord, who did this to you? He said, Arius rent it. By dividing my body, which I, by dividing my people, which I redeem with my blood, do not receive him back into the one holy church. So therefore he didn't. The people believed what he said, 
and followed his word. Of course, shortly thereafter, Peter is beheaded. But his successors followed what he said. And he turned out to be right, because by no means did Arius stop his pernicious teaching. He continued to go throughout the kingdom and spread his lie that Christ was not God. It was a rather palpable theological statement he was making. Not theological, but philosophical. It made sense from a humanistic point of view. But it doesn't make sense in the ways of God. It did not make any sense according to the scriptures, even though he tried to use it, as all the heretics do. So eventually, of course, he ends up at the ecumenical synod, and he is renounced by the synod for his teaching, and with no humility, he continues his teaching. We heard several times in the Beatitudes today about his wretched death. Much as Judas, much as Herod, proclaiming himself to be a god, Arius' bowels fall out of him, to be delicate about it. The gross death. The God will not be mocked. And eventually, by those who suffered mightily for the faith, not the Arians, but those of the church who suffered mightily for the faith, faith Athanasius and all of them, the truth won out. The Church of Christ won out, as it always will. The Church of Christ will win out now, as it always will, if we maintain our unity as Christ calls us to maintain that unity. But not a unity of sentimentality, not a unity of I'm okay, you're okay, but a unity in truth. Because Christ is love, but Christ is also truth, and those things must always go together, because without the other, what is not love and what is not truth? So these fathers show us the way that we can live and be saved. Because we must rejoice in that Christ did redeem us with his blood. Christ does come to bring us to unity. Christ does come to raise us up to the right hand of the Father. A man cannot do that. But anyone who is less than man, once again, it doesn't work. Humanity has to be redeemed. Some man had to fulfill the law and the prophets, and only one did the God-man. So when Elder Kalinikos says, I thank thee, my God, that I have done nothing good on this earth, and though we had, I die orthodox. That should be what we're striving for every day, to offer a sacrifice of righteousness and hope in the Lord. Our sacrifice must be ourselves, our way of life, our holiness. We take it up to God and offer it to Him. He does the rest. He just wants us. He works out the salvation. He conquers death. He conquers sin. He raises us up to the right hand. He sends upon us the Holy Spirit. We must just simply offer ourselves to Him, which is a big task for us. But Elder Kalinikos lived a whole life of saying that, so that he might say in the end, I thank thee that I die orthodox. Brothers and sisters, let us strive in the last moments of our life, whenever those may be, today or 50 years from now or whenever, 70 years from now, I thank thee, Lord, that I die orthodox, united to your body of which you were the head. Amen. Amen.